My home feels musty today. It's because it's hot outside. Sorry, future Helena. Hello, everyone. I'm the Magic Llama of the Magic Llama Mood, and welcome to the first installment of a series that I would like to call Indie Game Corner. Doesn't that sound so incredibly cozy? Like you just want to curl up in the corner with a little blanket and a cup of tea and a book about a gruesome murder in a tiny English village. You know, just girly things. Today, we're going to start off strong with Cats of Cthulhu. Oh, so spooky. The book that I have was actually a freebie from a convention. Remember when we could go physically to conventions and didn't have to do online Gen Con? <sighs> but today, you and I are gonna learn everything we can about Cats of Cthulhu. Now, I only have book one, which is called the Necanomicon, or Necanomicon, because Neko means cat. You got it. And of course, it's referencing the classic Lovecraftian horror tome, the Necronomicon. This is spooky and religious and a very dense read. I don't recommend it. Hope I don't get cursed by saying that. This is book one of a three-part series of Cats of Cthulhu. The subsequent books expand the world. Cats of Cthulhu was written by Mr. Joel Sparks, who has written a couple of other games that sound rather interesting. There's a lot of fun stuff on that Kickstarter, I will tell you that. Now, if you are watching this now, it means that last night on twitch.tv slash hearthsingergames, I guest GM'd. And yes, I guest GM'd this game. So, what you're seeing is the prep for what happened last night. So this is a tiny little book. It's gonna be easy to learn this, I hope. <laughs> Otherwise, we may have a problem. To paint a picture of the world of Cats of Cthulhu, I'm gonna read you a little bit of the introduction that Mr. Joel wrote. Welcome to the real world. The world in which human civilization exists for the comfort of cats. In which incredibly ancient and powerful spirits vie for control of reality. In which only brave and clever felines have the wit and wherewithal to oppose grim and mystic cabals. And in which two-footed people live in blissful ignorance of all of these facts. My friend Dex, who I sent all this info to because he played in the game that was last night, time, said the world of the Cats of Cthulhu seems a lot like eldritch horror, Lovecraft stuff, slammed together with some Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats by T.S. Eliot. For those of you that don't know Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, it is a poetic anthology by T.S. Eliot that later became the lyrics to most of the songs in Andrew Lloyd Webber's production of Cats. So far, it seems like cats are king in this world. Two-footed people, aka humans, are definitely lesser beings in this world. Cats in real life treat us like we're lesser, so... Let's get some terminology out of the way. Instead of a game master in this game, we have a cat herder, which is gonna be me, or which was me, because it was last night. The cat herder is going to be driving the story forward, asking for certain roles from the cats, the players. It sounds like you'll never need more than three D6s to play this game. However, there are special cat dice that you can buy on the Kickstarter page. Probably gonna buy a set for myself shortly. <laughs> We may be dealing with six-sided dice, but none of the players are going to do math because Joel Sparks tells us cats don't do math, so they don't have to worry about any numbers. As with most RPGs, a great place to start is character creation. This is gonna flavor your perception of the world even better. Part one of Cats of Cthulhu, book one, the Necronomicon, that's so fun to say, is just called Being Cats. This is how you make your cat character. Now, Mr. Sparks reminds us that apart from their level of mental activity, the cats in this game are cats. They cannot talk or read or write or drive cars or post on the internet. They don't wear clothes except as an occasional indulgence of a sentimental human. <laughs> And they don't have thumbs to use tools, nor a primate's tool-using mindset. 
To oppose the strivings of evil cabals and brutish foes, players have to be inventive, use trickery, and find ways to make others do the dirty work. A cat's life is improv. And that poses a nice jungle gym of challenge that the players can climb around and improv through. So the three defining traits of a cat character in this world are its role, its background, and its description. Let's start with role. In Cats of Cthulhu, your role is basically what your class or archetype would be in a game like D&D. Your role is going to determine what you are good at, what you are talented at, and give you a little boost in convincing the cat herder that you are definitely the right kitty for the job. There are five roles that you can play in Cats of Cthulhu. First up is the cat crabat. Yes, I didn't just mispronounce the word acrobat, I said cat crabat. Yeah. The cat crabat is essentially this game's rogue. You're super stealthy and super dexterous. On all athletic checks, you are the one to look at. Cat crabats are the ones that are gonna go in first, either running or fighting. It's interesting because cats aren't strong in the way that we perceive strong. They are incredibly dexterous instead. So it makes sense that the cat crabat would be the first into the fight. The second of the five roles is the pussyfoot. This is definitely Marie from the Aristocats. You're super cute, super playful, but also incredibly spoiled and very used to getting what you want. You're a charmer. You're going to get that overpriced piece of cat furniture with all of the bows on it and then shred it to bits. The third type of role that you can choose is called a scrapper. And like the name suggests, a scrapper is a bit scrappy. You're big and tough. You're maybe covered in battle scars from I don't know, fights with the local dog gang. This is definitely the pal that you're gonna turn to when you need to intimidate someone. The fourth type of role that you can play is called the Tiger Dreamer. This is the cat that is wise beyond its years. In fact, wise beyond its entire lifetime. This is your druid. This is someone that is extremely connected to their ancestry and their past and the earth and what it means to be descended from the big cats. Like the name suggests, in your dreams, you are visited by inspiration and wisdom that can help you in your waking days. And the final role that you can play is a two-foot ologist. So a lot of cats live with humans. You can play as a cat that is in a nice domestic home in an apartment. Cats are perceptive beings, no matter what role they take on. And through their perception of the humans in their lives, two-footologists can learn to activate and operate simple machines. For example, this is the cat that figured out how to open the doorknob and now you have to lock the bathroom door so that the cat doesn't come in and join you and meow at you while you're doing your business. Moving on from roles, we now have background. Background is essentially the same thing as ancestry in D&D. It's who you are, where you're from, what your chemical makeups are, what, is, what are your genetics looking like? I always think it's really funny when people ask cat owners what kind of cat that is, and they'll be like, that's Rita, she's orange, we found her in a dumpster. And then you ask a dog owner, and they'll be like, oh, well, this is a 50% Bernese Mountain Dog and 93.9% Merga Schmerga Merga Burka. Nobody knows exactly what cats are, and that's okay. However, in this game, appearances can be just as important as your actions. Remember, cats express themselves mainly through body language. So in this game, it's important to ask yourself these questions. Is this a pure-blood cat? Is it a mixed-breed cat? People are going to react differently to a pure-blood cat versus a mixed-breed cat. Purebred cats are gonna catch your eye. Maybe that's that cat from the cat show or the one from the Friskies commercial. Whereas mixed-breed cats are more common. However, mixed breed cats are built for survival. They're gonna have a stronger constitution than their pure blood counterparts. So Mr. Joel tells us, the player can choose a real variety from Norwegian forest cat to chocolate point Siamese, or make up whatever name and traits seem most interesting to play. A seven toed Etruscan peccadillo perhaps, or a snow leopard long hair. So anything goes when it comes to cat creation. Other questions you need to ask yourself about your cat, you need to know what their eye color is, what their fur color is, are they short hair or long hair? And you also can play a hairless cat. 
And lastly, in our background creation, we need to create a name for our character. Anything goes for these names. I'll read you a couple that Mr. Sparks wrote down. Clarissa, Lord Rexington Archolomew of Pattering Meadows, or Mr. Tiddles. Or you can use a different kind of name, a name that you gave yourself. You could call yourself things like Throat Catcher, Shadow Fur, or Leapingist. The last thing you need to do before tying a little bow around your background and description is figure out what your cat's story is. Be clear about the past of your cat. Are you a feral cat? Are you a stray, a house cat, a foster cat? There are so many options that are going to help you in gameplay because once per game, you are allowed to recall something from your past that could help you in the current circumstances. The cat herder will then provide you with helpful information that you can glean from your own history. Finally, we've finished our character creation section. Congratulations, way to go. And now we get to learn to play the game. So like I said before, this game is all based on D6s or six-sided dice. You probably won't ever need more than three, though of course your cat herder is in charge, so whatever she says goes. If you don't have the specific Cthulhu dice, which are in the Kickstarter, link below, then you can use your normal D6. In that case, numbers one and two are your failures, and three to six are your successes. If a player is rolling two dice together, you never add the numbers. Cats don't do math. These are separate numbers. So let's do an example. I have rolled a three and a six. Those are two successes. Now, if I had rolled a two and a six, that would be a failure and a success. Since you're not adding the numbers, you can have a mixed roll. You can have something happen that's both good for the cats and bad for the cats. For my future cat herders out there, you're probably asking, what do we roll if we're villains? You roll the same exact way. If you roll a one or a two, that is bad for the cats, which means it's good for you. If you roll a three to six, that's good for the cats, which means it's bad for you. That does give the cats an advantage, but you want them to have that advantage. When cats come across a challenge that's not exactly normal for cats, they're gonna have to roll for it. When they come across one of these challenges, your player needs to roll 2d6. There are three challenge levels. First is easy. You need at least one success when you roll your two dice. For a normal level challenge, if you roll one success, that means your cat has a little bit of information but hasn't completely completed the task. Two successes on a normal challenge rating means, yeah, you've done it. Finally, there's a difficult challenge. As you probably guessed, for a difficult challenge, you need two successes. The cat herder is who's going to determine how hard certain challenges are and what successes look like and what failures look like. Of course, it's all going to be a part of a larger story, so each cat herder is going to do it a lot differently. Now you're probably wondering where all of that backstory and skills and role creating comes in. This is where it starts to get interesting. If one of your players feels like their character is the right cat for the job, they get one automatic success out of their 2d6 role. However, this is not gonna be every role. For example, on a perception role, it's called notice in this game, everybody's gonna roll that. Some people will notice, some people won't. However, if you're trying to turn on a radio, well, the two footologist should probably do that as he's been watching his owner Benji for many, many years. In D&D, there's this thing called inspiration. In Cats of Cthulhu, there are treats. In this game, as a reward, the cat herder can grant a player a treat. This can then be used to re-roll a failed roll. None of your cats can have more than three treats per session, and they don't carry over, so use those. Now what happens when you have no treats and you're not doing so good health-wise? Well, luckily, have you heard of pets? The good, good pets? A cat can recover some of its psychic energy by finding a human and persuading it to pet them. If you're playing a pussyfoot character, you don't have to persuade anyone, sweetie. You automatically get all the pets you need. However, if you're playing literally any other character, you're gonna have to get creative. How are you going to approach this human in a way that makes them say, oh, I absolutely need to pet this cat that looks like it's been through some stuff. There are some rules when it comes to pets. These rules apply in real life to cats as well. 
Crucially, the cat alone must decide when the petting is sufficient. Traditionally, exactly three strokes, the human is not allowed to stop by his own choice, nor to go on too long. Once the perfect petting is accomplished and the human dismissed, the player receives a new treat. People always say cats have nine lives. In this game, you don't have nine lives. You have nine chances to escape the inescapable. So you can choose to spend an entire life if you want to recover immediately from an injury or if you want to add glory to your attempt at a dire challenge. You only have nine, so use them wisely. Dire challenges, they are dire. <laughs> Any failure in a dire challenge will result in injury and even death. Only the right cat for the job can attempt a dire challenge. If a cat that has no experience with turning on that radio that is also a bomb tries to go in and do it, the cat automatically fails. You need the specialist in this case. But even for the specialist, you don't get that extra successful dice that you do in normal challenge rating rolls. You need two successful on your cat dice to succeed at the dire challenge and any failure will injure you. I mentioned glory before. If your cat wants to attempt a selfless, crazy Hail Mary act during a dire challenge without regards for their own life, they can give up one of their lives to add glory to their roll. So now they can roll three dice. Again, two successes will win the dire challenge. If you get any failures, you get injuries. And if you get three injuries, you are considered dying. And don't even think about using your treats on a dire challenge or a glorious attempt at one. Every tabletop RPG player loves a good death save. So if things are looking really bad, in this game we have brushes with death. If things are looking extremely mortal for your cat, the cat herder can decide to give you a brush with death. This means you can sacrifice one of your nine lives and roll three D6. On two successes, you can escape and pull yourself together with only one injury. On three successes, you escape and you are completely fine. On three failures, however, your time has come. There's always that one person in character creation that makes the brave idiot. Well, this one's for you. This one's called Blaze of Glory. Any cat can succeed at a challenge roll, whether it be a normal challenge roll or a dire challenge roll, if they decide to go out in a blaze of glory. You will automatically succeed, but you die. Very saint-like. That's maybe an end of season three arc. So there's an optional rule in this book that I really like and is definitely gonna add a lot of flavor to your game of Cats of Cthulhu, and it's called Snake Eyes and Midnight. So say that you really, really fail at a challenge roll. You get two ones. You have completed an embarrassing failure. Nicely done. Now you get to describe the improbable circumstance surrounding your embarrassing failure. The cat herder will guide you along the way, but I would take this upon myself as a player to make it really awkward. There is also an embarrassing success. This is what happens when the right cat for the job gets snake eyes on an easy challenge rating roll. Of course, since it's the right cat for the job, you still get one automatic success, which means you do succeed. However, it is also still super embarrassing. On the flip side of double ones, you of course have double sixes, which is called midnight in this game. This is your critical success. Your player can describe the exact scene of their triumph to the cat herder if they so choose. And the cat herder could dole out a couple treats if they were feeling nice about it. There are more rules of paw besides just the rule of doubles, but today I'll leave those a mystery so that you buy Cats of Cthulhu Book 1 The Necronomicon. Now what happens when your cat needs to fight for its little nine lives? That's where scrapping comes in. To resolve a fight, each fighter rolls two d6s. Remember, if it's the right cat for the job, they get one automatic success. However, if the enemy cat is also in their own way the right cat for the job, AKA they have pointy teeth and are prone to fighting, they also get one automatic success. The fighter with more successes chooses what result to inflict on their opponent. The results that the successful fighter gets to choose from are Dodge, stun, shove, grab, and hurt. These are pretty much your basic moves that you need when you're fighting someone. 
Now, shoving a mouse is a lot different than shoving a mastiff, so this is where cat herders come into play. You get to decide how the results play out and what that looks like in your story. At the end of the day, like any good RPG, it's all about storytelling. Book one, The Necronomicon, doesn't really provide any lore or jumping off points for eldritch history or happenings. So that's what book two is for. Make sure to check it out. I'm really interested to see how my guest GM spot on Hearthsinger Games is gonna go or went at this point. I'm really excited to get to run this game. This seems like a ton of fun and pretty user friendly. But with any horror game, you wanna check in with your GM regularly to make sure that everyone's feeling safe and happy at the table and that you are all telling the story you want to tell. I feel like I've just done a book report and I'm not mad at it. I hope this first installment of Indie RPG Corner has tickled your fancy and maybe makes you want to go play some eldritch horror but with cats. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and hit that bell to receive notifications for when I post new videos. Usually it's on Friday at 12 p.m., but who knows what the internet's going to have me do next. If you enjoy this kind of tabletop RPG gamer content, let me know in the comments. I would love to do more content on tabletop RPGs. They are one of my favorite things to do, and I'd love to share my knowledge and love with you. See ya. There are so many people in my hallway and I can't just walk out into the hall and be like I'm filming a thing and I have cat whiskers on my face and I'm talking about the Necronomicon except it's the Necronomicon what is going on I can't do that I can't just walk out there and pretend I'm normal <laughs>